information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod of Gold Money, and with me on the line from somewhere in the UK, I have John Butler, who is the Chief Investment Officer at Amphora Commodities Alpha, and also publishes the Amphora Report. Now, I was fortunate enough to talk to John, uh, I think it was at the very tail end of July, so it was about four or five months ago, uh, and we had a very interesting discussion then. And um, I think one of the things that he said was that policy-induced inflation will triumph over deflation as a means in which credit deleveraging occurs. Um, now, I think I would agree with that. Um, anyway, welcome to the podcast, John, and I think it's time we had an update. Oh, absolutely. Good. I'm looking forward to it. How do, how do you, uh, I mean, the comment about policy-induced inflation, um, uh, you haven't changed your mind on that, I guess. Oh, absolutely not. And if anything, there is simply more evidence that has accumulated recently that governments, uh, and of course, central banks, I'm speaking for both sides of the policy world, fiscal and monetary, um, that, that policy makers in general will absolutely respond to perceived natural deflationary pressure with inflationary policy responses. And if anything, those responses are becoming almost knee-jerk. Uh, they're coming very, very quickly uh, on the heels of any sign uh, that natural deflationary pressures are building. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's right. Um, the other aspect of this, uh, I think since I spoke to you, I found increasing evidence that central bankers firstly um, have a greater grasp of what they're facing than is commonly supposed. And secondly, they've actually got very little room for manoeuvre. And uh, I would categorise them as perhaps being rather frightened about it. Uh, do you get that sense? I do. I think central bankers are, are in a dilemma of their own making. Um, naturally, it is excessive money and credit growth that got us to where we are today. They have been responding to the natural uh, deflationary pressures associated with excessive money and credit growth by throwing even more money uh, and credit stimulus around. So they're, they're making their own problem worse. It's a classic version of kicking the can down the road, whatever metaphor you, you, you want to choose. Um, so yes, they're frightened, and yet it's their job, of course, to seem in control. Yet paradoxically, if you get truly desperate as a central banker to the point where you will do anything in your power to prevent deflation, um, then in fact, in a way, you want to communicate that you're, you are getting desperate, that you are perhaps that much closer to a policy of outright currency debasement, devaluation, helicopter drop of money, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and what, one wonders what the next step will be. So yes, they may be frightened, but they may almost feign being frightened because it might paradoxically serve their policy purpose to be frightened. Yeah, no, I th well, I suppose that's right. Um, I, in, in fact, I, I think to support what you're contending, I was very interested to see that the Financial Stability Board in America uh, produced a report on the global shadow banking um, I don't know. Did you see that report by any chance? Well, I, di I did see it, and I wasn't surprised at all by the result that the shadow banking system is even larger today than it was when the crisis unfolded in 2008. Yeah, I think they're now talking about $67 trillion equivalent, which is absolutely massive. Um, but, I, you know, the, the thing is that I, the, the shadow banking um, uh, aspect of uh, our financial sector is considerably larger than the banking sector. So what we've got is an off-balance sheet problem, which nobody is talking about, nobody sees, which is two to two and a half times the size of the U.S. Um, uh, credit markets. I mean, you know, bank bank credit markets. I mean, that is a phenomenal problem to manage, particularly when, by definition, if it's shadow banking, it's not under the control of the uh, of the Federal Reserve Board. Well, not directly under the control of the Federal Reserve Board. I mean, certainly, uh, 
indirectly, central bank policy will impact uh, the shadow banking system. But I think it is fair to say that their control is less direct. They have less of a sense of what's going on in real time. And certainly it adds to the complexity, the policy complexity of trying to artificially engineer a, a, a reflation as a counter to natural deflationary pressure. So it certainly compl- uh, complicates things. That said, you know, I hate to say this, but again, they can always rewrite the rules if they want to. And we've seen it happen in the past, and I feel strongly we'll see it happen in the future. Believe it or not, if the Federal Reserve or other central bank were desperate, crazy enough to go down – this road, you know, they could literally, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but they could literally take the entire shadow banking system's balance sheet onto their own balance sheet. Yes. They could acquire they could acquire the whole thing. I mean, if they really wanted to, they could acquire literally every asset or derivative thereof onto their own balance sheet in return for new money. They could theoretically rewrite the rules to allow themselves to do that. Anyone who thinks that a central bank cannot stop a deflation simply doesn't understand what a printing press is. I take the point. Now, it's, um, this is very much a what-if um, <laughs> situation. We have, uh, I think, bank credit is now beginning to, or has been expanding, I suppose, for the last few months, and is now at a higher level than it was Um, at the time of the banking crisis. So we now do have the increase in bank lending, which economists have been looking for as a sign of economic recovery. That is in the pipeline. Uh, That being the case, then the next stage in the interest rate scene is that interest rates should move up from zero to something. The problem with a shadow banking system is that the collateral that secures it is all, well, it's almost entirely... uh, um, bonds in the form of government debt in particular, sovereign debt, uh, and um, uh, if you like, securitized consumer debt and um, uh, you know, private sector debt of one form or another. So if you have a rise in interest rates, then that's going to undermine the value of that, uh, of, uh, that collateral. The shadow banking system doesn't now have any ca- capital because that's not the way it works. It's just purely, you know, um, we will extend this money to you in return for the collateral which you sign over to us, and we will hi- rehypothecate it to someone else to get our money, sort of thing. So, if we have a rise in interest rates, that's going to start undermining the um, uh, the shadow banking. Uh, collateral um, with um, potentially disastrous effects unless, as you say, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank takes this on its own balance sheet. I mean, <laughs> is, this, is this what I've got to read into what you're saying as a, as, well, well, as yes, a possible I mean, outcome? I, it- in my, in my past writings, I have referred to that as what I, I call it the nuclear option. That it, it, you're, you're literally going nuclear at that point if a central bank basically just indiscriminately takes the collateral onto its balance sheet in exchange for new uh, new dollars uh, that it prints or whatever currency uh, it, it might be. Um, it's, it's not just a monetization in the traditional sense of buying more and more and more government bonds in exchange for freshly printed money, but it's literally buying any asset regardless of quality, regardless of price. You just take it and monetize it. Um, it is guaranteed to create inflation, but then again, it's guaranteed to destroy your currency. And that's why I call it the nuclear option, because in fact, at that point, you're into the bizarro world of mutual assured destruction. Yes. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, hold on a minute, um, John. You're now talking about a situation where uh, I think I'm right in saying, and I'm, I'm going on a figure that I read uh, Kyle Bass produced that the, the, the central banks uh, since um, I think 2003 or something have increased their balance sheets from 3 trillion to 13 trillion. So we're talking about something happening on top of an already huge increase. Now, so far, uh, I don't think that the precious metals prices have reflected this at all. I mean, have, you, have you got any views on why this might not be the case? Well, first of all, I mean, you and I spend a lot of time thinking about these things, but a lot of people don't. And in fact, a lot of people in the financial world even 
don't think about it. And they've been conditioned not to think about it. You know, the vast majority of people who work in finance today work in finance in large part because they have fundamental faith and trust in the system. They they see what's happening today as you know, perhaps bigger problems than normal, but they're still problems that are understandable, that are surmountable, that can be dealt with, or at a minimum, if you simply wait long enough, maybe they simply go away of their own accord. Um, you, know, you and I don't think that way. Uh, we think very differently. We think that finance, uh, which rests on a foundation of elastic, arbitrarily manipulated political money, the supply and value of which uh, is, again, arbitrarily manipulated to serve some political end, um, we know that that is a fundamentally unsound foundation for finance and for global commerce. And so we, we naturally are, are quick to look at what's happening with the expansion of central bank balance sheets and to look back at what this implies historically as well as theoretically – and, it, and it's crystal clear the conclusions you reach, either from a theoretical point of view uh, or a historical point of view, is that this is going to end in tears, that um, you, there is going to be a very, very dramatic devaluation, which could even result in currencies outright collapsing and ceasing to be used uh, for uh, – day-to-day -day transactions, much less uh, for savings. Um, now, naturally, uh, the, the price of gold and other money alternatives, if you want to call them that, other precious metals, for example, or any, uh, any marketable commodity, I would say, can be a theoretical money substitute. You know, naturally, those prices should be rising to reflect these risks. And yes, they may be rising, but they're not rising by nearly the same order of magnitude. I ascribe that to what I said, that most people active in the financial world today just don't understand the very, very uh, severe position that we're in. Yeah, I suppose the two elements of that. I, the, the first is that um, today's generation of market strategists, if I can call them that, um, went to university and probably got an economics degree in Keynesian economics and monetarist economics rather than um, anything more seriously founded. And I suppose the second thing is that if you're actually physically on a desk trying to manage, or on a desk in a bank, trying to manage um, a, a collateral thing, you're just looking at gold as another form of collateral, I suppose. Um, and uh, this is, of course, the whole basis of the bullion bank, um, the, you know, the London bullion bank market. I mean, one ounce of gold can earn an awful lot of money for the banks in terms of fees, banking fees, um, you know, leasing, buying and selling in the markets, whatever, whatever. It's, it's, the, it's the pathway to loads and loads of different forms of income for the bank. And nobody steps back from it and sort of looks at it and says, um, you know, hold on a minute. Is this actually being properly priced? I mean, it, 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 is, is that, am I right in getting this sense from what you're saying? I, I think that is the case. That said, around the margin, you do have people who step back and look at the system and realize where this is probably going and who then take action to protect themselves by acquiring some amount of physical allocated gold, silver, or they buy up real productive assets in, in some form through uh, whatever it is, partnerships, equity purchases, whatever it might be. I mean, just to give you an example of that latter uh, point, um, I had a very interesting discussion with a gentleman this week um, whose family – has developed uh, a number of steel mills in various locations around the world, and yet for the last five years, they have stopped expanding their steel production capacity, and all the cash being generated by their somewhat mature steel business has been siphoned off into the purchase of gold mining and production assets. Really? That's very it's been a strategic – this, this, this is a very wealthy family, and they've taken it into their own hands. So you do have economic agents, as it were, uh, taking action around the margins, and certainly these sorts of actions do place upward pressure on the price of gold and other precious metals and monetary substitutes um, – or monetary alternatives, I should say. Um, but within the heart of the financial system itself, where the vast majority of day-in, day-out flows between this and that asset take place, it's still only a very small minority of people who see the danger uh, and see the future 
uh, based on the current set of policymaker choices. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. I'm sure that's right. Um, let's let's move on and look at Europe, um, which is very much in the headlines now. Uh, I mean, Greece just cannot uh, uh, be resolved. It seems um, every time they have a meeting, they all agree to disagree and they reconvene to go. And I mean, do you see any solution to this? Well, I think solution may be the wrong word in the sense that if you if you think there is a way to magically make the debt disappear or magically restructure it without uh, any economic ill effects, uh, no, there there is no solution. There there is no free lunch. The fact is, if you borrow money you can't pay back, uh, then not only the borrower but also the lender uh, is going to have a problem. I and mean, that's just the way these things work. Um, it, it, think of it in a stepping away from the, uh, finance for a moment. Think of it just fundamentally economic terms. If you if you consume uh, everything today that you would otherwise have consumed over the next month, well, then you're going to you know you'll, you'll be quite full today. But boy, you're going to be very very hungry after a few weeks' time. And that that's just the reality of the situation that Greece and other uh, over indebted countries are in. There there is no policymaker magic wand that can prevent the rebuilding of savings that is required if you have overborrowed and overspent. Um, so it, it's all politics. Uh, it's all public relations, in fact, for uh, to the extent that it's being done by bu- uh, largely unelected bureaucrats rather than elected uh, politicians. And that's all it is. Now, don't get me wrong. As we discussed a moment ago, there are lots of people in the financial markets who nevertheless take these meetings very, very seriously – and who think that you know fundamental economic problems are being addressed and are being dealt with, and solutions are out there. They just need to be found. Um, it, there's a small minority who think the way we do, or at least I, I think you think the way I do in this matter, that no, there is fu- a fundamental economic reality here that is simply being denied uh, by the policymakers, and the only way out of this is to rebuild savings over a sustained period of time, and then. Uh, resumption of healthy, sustainable economic growth will again be possible. I agree with you entirely about the savings, but I mean that's that's all sort of long-term stuff. And for crisis management, it's sort of um, you know it's it's like a fairy tale. They wish they, perhaps they were there. Um, I you know going back to uh, the sh- this shadow banking report that that what that showed. Um, is that apparently there's $22 trillion equivalent of shadow banking tied up in the Eurozone. Now, isn't that a very, very big incentive for the ECB to keep the whole thing together? Because if that starts disintegrating, you've got the potential for a global uh, systemic um, problem. Yes? Uh, Yes, yes, I agree. And again, this is one of those... This, this is one of those very difficult topics to discuss, and even people like myself who I believe appreciate the scale of the problem nevertheless shudder when we do force ourselves to try and understand the implications in their entirety. I mean the fact is it is horrific. I mean the implications are horrific. And I – another story, another recent uh, just quick um, uh, anecdotal point I would like to make is that I was having a dinner with a a retired uh, successful investment banker uh, two weeks ago. And he is one of the people who finally sort of came to see the light that uh, modern finance is fundamentally flawed. It's on an unsound monetary foundation and and, and so on and so forth. So he recognizes the scale of the problem. but But then the conversation over dinner turned in the following direction. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, what do you think we should do about it? And he said, nothing, <laughs> because, because he's so terrified of the unwind process, he actually thinks the responsible thing to do is to pretend the problem isn't there. And I was shocked at that response, and yet the more I think about it, the less shocked I am. Um, it really is a scary, scary proposition to embrace um, – the workout process uh, that is going to be required to deal with these problems. And I guess in a sense, perhaps you have to be a parent, and I I am a parent. Perhaps you you literally need to be in the position of a parent feeling responsible for your children to have a willingness to deal with the problems now and not to leave the problems for them. I mean that's the way I have come to think about it because that's how big the problem is. It will take perhaps a full generation to truly sort this out. 
Yeah, it's it's um, it, it it is uh, very very difficult. I agree with you entirely. Um, have you any view on Japan? Because that is an extraordinary situation. There, you've got the you know the demographic time bomb is sort of exploding now, and um, uh, their trade position is actually beginning to, ter- to, to der- deteriorate quite uh, substantially. Uh, and on top of that, um, they're on I don't know the umpteenth version of QE trying to stop the economy imploding um a, the, the yen and certainly until very recently has been holding up pretty well with um virtually no interest rates at all there um and uh, it looks like a situation which should have fallen over quite some time ago what's what's your take on the yen well i think it's actually very very significant I, i'm pleased you're bringing this up because in fact this is something i've given a lot of thought to recently although to be fair i mean i, I have followed japan closely for many years but something is changing now japan has moved from being a net creditor to the world uh, and is now becoming is starting to become a net debtor you know japan has supplied savings to the rest of the world for decades and yet Japan now is no longer a net supplier of savings. And what we said a moment ago, uh, what we discussed a moment ago about needing to rebuild savings, well, now imagine what this means. It's not just about Japan having real trouble now and have, struggling to, to export, um, struggling to uh, finance its accumulated debt and so on. But if it's not able to channel any of its savings out to the rest of the world, well, then it's going to place upward pressure, natural upward pressure on interest rates around the world. And if there is natural upward pressure on interest rates around the world because Japan is no longer supplying savings to the rest of the world, well, then central banks will have to step in to fill the gap if they want to resist that rise in interest rates. And under a Keynesian model, based on stimulating aggregate demand, well, that's exactly what central banks are going to do. So what's happening in Japan when you look at the global implications of it, implies a general increase in the amount of central bank stimulus. So it's not just about Japan. It's about the entire world. And so I see Japan as kind of a canary in the coal mine, as it were, for an even more aggressive policy on the part of the Fed, the the ECB, and any other central bank that is still following uh, a Keynesian mindset that you need to suppress interest rates to stimulate aggregate demand and that that will, uh, over time, uh, work off this debt problem. It won't. It won't work. Uh, and what's happening in Japan uh, is going to just bring the day of reckoning closer, in my opinion. It sounds like um, <laughs> you're describing a situation which I, on the rare occasions I play chess because I'm so awful at it. Um, you know, I can see the forces coming in from my opponent and putting me into a position where I know it's going to be checkmate in a matter of moves. Financially, you're describing a position of, of checkmate. Now, we don't give investment advice at all, but um, <laughs> how personally do you think that you will escape the worst implications of this? Well, you you know that I am a strong believer that the the world is simply uh, over indebted, over leveraged, uh, and that we've got to go through a general deleveraging, um, and we've got to rebuild savings uh, in order to resume healthy, sustainable growth. The problem is is that policymakers are not willing to allow this deleveraging uh, to run its natural course because that would be very deflationary. That would result in bank failures. That would almost certainly result in the current set of politicians and policymakers in power being thrown out of power, um, something that obviously they don't want. But then again, of course, it would also be very, very disruptive. And, and regardless, and no politician or policymaker ever wants to uh, allow such a period of disruption to occur on, on their watch. But the fact is, if they – resist that natural deleveraging and deflation, well, they'll do it by printing money. They will do it by acquiring assets and monetizing those assets. And as an investor, you need to protect yourself from that. The best way to protect yourself is to acquire something which cannot be devalued, which cannot be uh, restructured, which cannot be defaulted on. And that something is a, a real asset of some kind. I mean, historically, gold and silver 
are the preferred alternative monetary assets. Um, but look, if you own uh, arable farmland, if you own food processing or storage facilities, if you own energy production, refining, transport or storage facilities, anything that is a fundamental necessary component of global commerce um, that cannot be arbitrarily devalued or defaulted on, you know, this is what you want to own. So I'm, I'm a huge fan, yes, or a huge proponent, I would say, um, of acquiring physical allocated precious metals. But there are a range of other uh, investment choices, I believe, that individuals can make to help protect themselves from what is going to be a very, very challenging uh, investment environment. And, and in fact, there, there's nothing in our lifetime um, that we can point to uh, which gives us any direct firsthand experience of what this is going to be like, with the exception of those who lived through the meltdown of the former uh, Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact uh, countries. I think people who experienced that firsthand will have an advantage going forward in preparing for what is going to have to happen. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but believe me, we are going to have stories to tell our children and grandchildren uh, down the road. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I'm, I just wish I could construct an argument to disprove what you're saying, but I think that would be completely futile. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much indeed for coming on, John. But before we sign off, um, can you just tell us how our listeners can uh, log into the Amphora report, where they find it and so on, because I'm sure a lot of them will be very interested to follow what you, what you write and, um, and any comments you have. Uh, absolutely. I do maintain a website at www.amphora-alpha dot com that's a m p h o r a dash alpha dot com my amphora report newsletter is posted to that website um, we also maintain a distribution list so for those who would like to receive it in their inbox when it uh, is sent out we can always arrange for that as well so i i would encourage anyone interested in this subject matter to have a glance at the topics that i've covered in the report over the past few years and i i hope people find it helpful uh, and uh, hopefully also don't find it too boring. I, I try to make it at least a slight, a slightly entertaining read, notwithstanding the somewhat grave subject matter that I, I do cover from time to time. Well, as a keen reader of, uh, of what you write, uh, John, I can endorse that for our listeners. And um, so anyway, thank you very much indeed for taking time out to speak to us. My pleasure, Alistair. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section. Central bankers are, are in a dilemma of their own making. Um, naturally, it is excessive money and credit growth that got us to where we are today. They have been responding to the natural uh, deflationary pressures associated with excessive money and credit growth by throwing even more money uh, and credit stimulus around. So they're, they're making their own problem worse. It's a classic version of kicking the can down the road, whatever metaphor you, you, you want to choose. Um, so yes, they're frightened. And yet it's their job, of course, to seem in control. Yet paradoxically, if... The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod of Gold Money, and with me on the line from somewhere in the UK, I have John Butler, who is the Chief Investment Officer at Amphora Commodities. They're coming very, very quickly uh, on the heels of any sign uh, that natural deflationary pressures are building. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's right. Um, the other aspect of this, uh, I think since I spoke to you, I found increasing evidence that central bankers firstly um, have a greater grasp of what they're facing than is commonly supposed. And secondly, they've actually got very little room for manoeuvre. And uh, I would categorise them as perhaps being rather frightened about it. Uh, do you get that sense? 
I do. I think so. The comment about policy-induced inflation, um, uh, you haven't changed your mind on that, I guess. Oh, absolutely not. And if anything, there is simply more evidence that has accumulated recently that governments uh, and, of course, central banks, I'm speaking for both sides of the policy world, fiscal and monetary, um, that, that policy makers in general will absolutely respond to perceived natural deflationary pressure with inflationary policy responses. And if anything, those responses are becoming almost knee-jerk. Uh, Alpha, and also publishes the Amphora report. Now, I was fortunate enough to talk to John, uh, I think it was at the very tail end of July, so it was about four or five months ago, uh, and we had a very interesting discussion then. And um, I think one of the things that he said was that policy-induced inflation will triumph over deflation as a means in which credit deleveraging occurs. Um, now, I think I would agree with that. Um, anyway, welcome to the podcast, John. I think it's time we had an update. Oh, absolutely. Good. I'm looking forward to it. How do, how do you uh, – I mean, 